Okay, so here's the plan. Um, basically, I will just present an argument that targets easy ontology. I think from what I'm going to present, you can draw a bit more general conclusions, which I will not do, though. And the talk is structured as follows. I give you a brief thing about conservativeness. I, I introduce a bit of easy ontology. I present my argument, and then I, I kind of just defend my premises. So I show you why I think um, easy ontology is committed to the premises I'm using. So starting with conservativeness, um, basically ever since at least uh, fields science below numbers, it plays a certain role in ontological debates. I'm not claiming that's all it does, uh, just here is a way of introducing one formulation of what is conservativeness, namely uh, one theory T prime conservatively extends another theory T. If uh, whatever you can formulate in the base language here of T, if the extended theory proves something, that is already formulatable in that form, uh, form of theory, then the form of theory needs to prove it as well or derive it or whatever. I don't, for here, I, I don't really care how to spell it out in, in detail, just in principle. The idea is um, what the extension says about the part that hasn't been extended, that was already there, needs already being set by the theory beforehand. Um, Field's strategy is to use this basically to argue for a form of nominalism. Um, we don't need to care about this now, but some something similar might pop up later on, depending on maybe what the questions will be. So, so much for the conservativeness part. What is easy ontology? Well, the base principle is uh, called principle E here, namely case exists if and if only if the application conditions actually associated with K are fulfilled. And in this context, we replace K with a general noun. Thomason claims that you can also um, apply her approach to particular objects. She doesn't really say anything more than that. And I'm not going to say much more here because it's going to come up in the following. So how does easy ontology try to make this principle E work? Well, um, it suggests what Thomason calls easy arguments, namely arguments which start from uncontroversial premises. And these are such that one, um, the premises don't include a certain term T. However, the premises guarantee that T's application conditions are satisfied. And given that we have uh, the satisfaction of the application conditions, we can apply principle E to conclude that uh, corresponding entities exist. That's the basic idea. And we start from uncontroversial premises because we want to take some relatively, well, some reasoning that is also hopefully uncontroversial and based on conceptual truth to conclude that certain entities exist. Um, particularly, easy ontology claims to um, infer the existence of abstract entities such as numbers. And an example from Thomason taking herself is this for such an argument um, from a sentence like the table is brown, which I suppose is, can be taken to be uncontroversial. We may infer the table has the property of brownness. So we realize that the table is brown somehow guarantees that uh, the application conditions of property are satisfied. And therefore, we conclude using principle E that there are properties. OK, so what about the application conditions themselves then? The, the main motivation is that we need to circumvent what is called the QA problem. I'm not going to say too much about it, just what's important for us is um, how Thomason thinks she, she can circumvent this particular problem. Um, the QA problem itself is a problem of indeterminate reference, which more or less targets um, causal theories of reference. And to kind of circumvent that, uh, Thomason insists that nominative terms must be associated with a sortal or more generally a categorical concept. And these are basically what ground then the reference to 
circumvent the qua problem and they give us more or less the application conditions of the term and these are supposed to be conceptual truth uh, so given that we have application conditions we have terms uh, the question is isn't there still a problem here one you might run into a circularity namely that you only can kind of um, explicate more or less application conditions by reference to what you already need to infer then as existing and to address the sort of circularity problem that is spelled out in, in Brenner and in my publication um, we need to to employ basically a strategy to to kind of get rid of the circle and the way that Thomason suggests to do that is by distinguishing terms into basic and derivative terms. And I say a bit more about them later on. We can note here already that the basic terms are used to introduce the derivative terms, given that certain conditions are satisfied. And one of those conditions is uh, a conservativeness condition. And as I argue, this will be problematic for reasons that will become clear in a bit so what's the argument then basically i have four premises the, the first premise is that um, we have a conservativeness requirement namely as formulated here a term is only then minimally introduced more on that later if the extending language conservatively extends the language to be extended the second premise is um, that the base language with which we start only contains con uh, terms for concrete entities. And for short, I will just call them concrete terms. And similarly, I will call terms that refer to abstract, uh, abstract terms. Um, the third premise is that in our base language, we can already express abstractness. And the last premise is that certain inferences, namely basically easy derivations, um, are analytic. So with these four premises, what do I want to conclude? Well, the conclusion is roughly that easy ontology cannot infer abstractum. So why is that and how does it roughly work? Um, in principle, the idea, the argument, or what the argument intends to show is that um, uh, that we cannot introduce certain terms, namely terms for abstract entities. And why is this problematic then? Well, easy ontology wants to use principle E that we've seen before to infer the existence of corresponding abstract entities. However, principle E only applies if you actually have managed to introduce a term. So if you cannot introduce the term, you cannot introduce, uh, you cannot infer the existence. Um, why is or where does the problem come from? As I would argue, it comes from here. I call it T conservativeness. We will see that in a bit. Namely, Thomason's version of conservativeness. And roughly, the idea is we start from a language in which we can express that something is abstract, but it doesn't follow in in that language. So it is not analytically entailed. But if we introduce abstract terms, we actually get the analytic entailment that something is abstract. Hence, we have an implication or analytic entailment which violates the conservativeness requirement. That is the idea of the argument. A bit more using actually our premises. So we start from a base language, which only consists of concrete terms via base language premise. Um, as just argued, in the space language, it is not analytic entailed that something is abstract. Why is that so? Well, basically, there is nothing abstract there yet, so it cannot be entailed. However, let us now introduce some abstract term and consider the extended language. Then we get this analytic entailment, and I will give the argument in a bit that something is abstract analytically follows from or in this extended language. 
Hence, we have an analytic entailment that the base language didn't have. And, but since the base language and here the other premise comes in is expressible already, um, this is a violation of conservativeness. Therefore, we haven't introduced an abstract term in the sense of Thomason. Hence, we cannot use principle E to infer that corresponding entities exist. So this is the argument. In short, what I will do in the rest of the talk is just um, more or less tell you the reasons why you sh why the premises obtain. So it's structured in two ways, um, in two parts. The one is regarding the conservatism requirement, the other one regarding abstractness. So firstly, conservativeness. Um, as I told you before, Thomason distinguishes terms into basic ones and derivative ones. And I haven't really said anything more than that there is such a distinction. So let us look at how it actually were or how it is spelled out a bit more. So what does Thomason say about basic terms? Well, she says that they are those terms which we tend to learn early in our cognitive and linguistic development and that we make use of in acquiring other concepts and learning to use other terms. That is how she understands basic in for basic terms. And I think that already gives us my premise um, base language, namely that it only uh, consists of concrete terms. When we start learning uh, terms, we don't learn abstract terms. I mean, there is a sense of abstract in which we might learn abstract terms, but that's not relevant here. Abstract is meant as like numbers are, or sets are supposed to be abstract entities. And I suppose that's also, I'm, I'm not sure how controversial it is. I would think that it's not. Um, we start by learning more or less concrete uh, or names for concrete objects, table, whatever. More on that in a bit, actually. Um, so the question is then how, given that this is, we have this, we have a set of terms from which we start, how go, how do we go on from there? Well, we have to introduce new terms, the derivative ones. How does that work? As she is explicit here, once basic terms are in place, these are the ones we start with, we can introduce new nouns on the basis of others. So we use these basic terms to introduce derivative terms. And here are the examples of what um, Thomason suggests for the basic terms, um, what Carla calls the thing language, such as piece of paper, desk, and the like. So very concrete entity. Terms of this category, such as store, cup, or teddy, tend to figure prominently in early language acquisition. OK, so I think what's more or less established now is that she agrees that we start learning um, more or less what I call concrete terms. And she tells us we need to use those to introduce derivative terms. How exactly do we do that? Well, there are certain problems, hence we need further conditions. One problem is the bad company problem, as I guess it came up a few times already in previous talks, and I'm not gonna spell out what the problem in Grant is. In principle, or in a nutshell, the problem will be or is that you might be able to introduce terms which destroy your language, in our case of theory or whatever. It might go inconsistent or whatever. Um, and Thomason wants to circumvent that. She places a few more conditions on how to introduce terms. The first one here is that we introduce um, them via conditionals, which give sufficient conditions for their application. And crucially, they must be stated using the extant terms of the language from which we start from, or terms that we have already minimally introduced. So once we introduce some, we are allowed to use them again to introduce further terms. But at the end of the day, we need to spell them out in, in whatever language we started from. And this in particular means that they must, in some sense, be reducible to a combination of basic terms. I'm, I'm also not going to say what these combinations are or anything. Um, it's just whatever 
works for her works for me here. So that was the one, the, the second condition here on um, for term introduction. And lastly, the conservativeness. Um, here's how Thomason, the T conservativeness, uh, formulates it. Introducing a term must not analytically entail anything statable in unextended L that was not already analytically entailed by truth stated in L. This is a version of the familiar conservativeness requirement. So she notices this is, she takes, she realizes there's a problem, the bad company problem. The standard solution is more or less this move where we have a conservativeness requirement and she adopts that for her approach. The difference is of course, we talk here about languages. So she actually does have such a conservativeness requirement confirming my premise conservativeness requirement. Okay. With that, uh, we can say what roughly, I'm also not flashing it out too much. I will just more or less give you what I need for my argument to work. Namely, what still needs to be said is what analytic entailment is. And here's how Thomas introduces this. I use the expression analytic entail to mean entail in virtue of the meanings of the expressions involved in rules of inference. So that a sentence or a set of sentences by analytically entails a sentence psi, just in case given only logical principles and the meanings of the terms involved, the truth of phi guarantees the truth of psi. And crucially, she adds in a footnote, and this is my premise, uh, my fourth premise, cases of purely logical entailments considered as entailments just in virtue of rules of inference knowable by competent speakers, merely on the basis of their reasoning abilities would also count trivially as analytic entailments, in which the meanings involved are making an essential contribution to the entailment. So easy derivations, inferences will count as analytic entailments. This again confirms my third premise. So basically what's left is the last one, which has to do with abstractness. What is that? Um, name it. Um, what we still need, more or less for my argument to work, is uh, we need to be able to express abstractness in our base language. And we need to show that something is abstract is actually an analytic entailment in the extended language. So here's how the letter works. Um, we want to introduce an abstract term, which means we have to say something about like in some way specifying that it is abstract. This is what I do here. So from that, we get, of course, that E, the entity you started from, is abstract. And from that, it follows that something is abstract. And given that all I used here is more or less a conjunction elimination and an existential generalization, I think the previous condition here is satisfied. These are simple rules of inference. Hence, we get an analytic entailment here of something is abstract. Of course, it depends on having something here around already. This is why we need to go into the extension. So given that these are analytic entailments, we see something is abstract is analytically entailed. OK, so the last one to go through is to realize that actually base language can express abstractness. And that gives you a bit of an idea what I take the base language to be. Roughly speaking, it's just ordinary English minus certain terms, which would more or less refer to abstractor and give you the existence of abstractor. So it's basically English minus certain um, nouns, more or less. So. Uh, why does the work here? Well, Thomas and herself insists on several occasions that she's talking about and using ordinary English. Uh, I think ordinary English is very much capable of expressing abstractness. So what's also interesting here to note is I don't really make too much, um, I, I don't really spell out what abstractness is or how you spell this out or whatever. Uh, at this point, I don't really care. So I haven't really said that much. The, the idea is still abstractness, whatever 
falls under it, we want numbers, sets, and mathematical logical entities to fall under them. Those which are, are usually disputed by nominalists. So moreover, if, if the base language was not able to express abstractness, it's also not really clear how we would introduce anything abstract because we might be able to introduce new terms with the machinery Thomas has given us, but it is not clear that what you've introduced are abstract terms in that form. You would just introduce certain things which might be um, abstract in a certain sense, but not in the relevant sense here. So suppose I introduce a new term for just something like table or chair. This, whatever that thing might be, it would still remain a concrete thing. I, I haven't really done enough to make it something abstract in that relevant sense here. So if, if we start from a language in which we cannot express abstractness, given what Thomason tells us, it's highly unclear how you could even introduce anything abstract and show it to be abstract. So given then that the restriction plays on the introduction of terms, and this is again Thomas and trying to circumvent on the one hand a circularity issue that lurks in the background, on the other hand, um, getting around a bad company problem. She needs those uh, conditions on the introduction of terms. It seems like there is no way left to introduce abstractness or abstract terms into an extended language, which also satisfies the conservativeness requirement. Hence, we haven't actually introduced the right sort of term to use principle E to infer that something is abstract or that certain entities exist, namely abstract entities. Okay, that was actually already everything I had. So again, just the references if you like. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jonas. Oh, I see two, well, I see two hands raised up. So, well, Susanna, please. Hi, Hi. thank you so much. I, I, uh, I found it very interesting and very helpful. I have to say I myself um, um, I was a bit puzzled. Now your talk helped with the Thomason's notion of the basic terms. I feel like she uses them a lot. She, she talks about the basic terms all the time, but she doesn't really explain them in, in a lot of detail. So I think the quotes that you show and the examples were actually very helpful for me. It clarified a bit. But the question that I have is about something else. I'm thinking about um, this principle abstractness and this idea, like how we extend um, the language in order to talk about abstract terms by using only concrete terms. And well, since I've been working on abstraction principles, my first thought was that it's exactly how we do it with abstraction principles. So, you know, we start with the base language that is normally on the right-hand side of the abstraction. And then we talk in terms of concrete terms. Like for example, we just look at forks and knives and compare them. And that's how we get to the notion of a number. Or like we look at two lines and we see that they look the same and that's how we get to the notion of direction. So wouldn't Thomason say that it just works exactly like in the case of abstraction. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I, I would have to guess. <laughs> I can tell you what I would say. Um, so some of these abstraction principles for me fail because, I mean, fail in a certain sense. They fail as getting you from concrete to abstract in, in that sense, because I think that there would to be needed something more. And usually, if you look at these abstraction principles, something very abstract is on both sides. So right. maybe you introduce numbers on the one hand, uh, but on the other side, it, it's, it talks about functions or something like that. And I don't know what that is, but abstract. So as to what would Thomason say, I think she would try to do that, but I, I think she would fail for the reasons I, I alluded to just now. So it, 
you're right in saying she talks a lot about basic terms and she doesn't really say what this really amounts to. This is basically the only the only time she explains it a little bit. And I think she just trusts that we go along with it. In my other paper, I spell it out a bit more regard because there I address the the circularity issue in particular. I know, I know. I actually I read the paper. Okay, cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, so at that point, it, it just, I think she she thinks it works, but I think if you actually try to write it down and do the formal footwork to make it work, you will fail for the reasons I, I, I try to explain in the presentation. Because you cannot really introduce them without some fancy trick, which more or less gives you something abstract and tells you that it is abstract in the, in the same way. So this talk is based on a longer paper where I go, where I make this also a bit more explicit. Like uh, you, you might introduce number terms, which just fail to be abstract. Like do it as it with finite arithmetic, you know, you can just do some logic and get it all of that. And then it's just not clear that you actually introduce something abstract in the right sense of the word. Right. And to get to that interesting number concept that we apparently um, have, what tells me that or what I take it to mean is that easy ontology isn't a way to get there. It might look sometimes, I think it's easy to mistake them because we just use the same word for a lot of different concepts. And that is kind of tricking us into believing that there are actually numbers coming from easy ontology or some such uh, approaches. Okay. Is that helpful? Yes, yeah. Um, but just like um, to clarify, so, and, and to get back again to abstraction principles, so would you say that they just, um, they also fail to meet the conservativeness requirement in some sense? I, in so far as they, I mean, given that you start from something abstract, they don't do that. Mm -hmm. And I think that is roughly what I also just alluded to in generalizing what I claimed about easy ontology. That is an additional problem in there. Because, I mean, it's not the neo free game program to give you uh, basically abstracta from nothing. That's not the point. They start from something very abstract and tell you, okay, from that you can get all of the other cool stuff, which is totally fine if it works. It's not really clear that it works. If it's meant as an argument to saying, I start here from something very concrete and I move over to something abstract, then I think, yes, the, the, the argument would apply similarly. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Next question is from Elia. Elia, please. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I have a question about uh, it's uh, it, it's uh, to to see something works that is similar to your argument, but uh, I I find it a bit problematic to suppose that we already have uh, abstractness in the base uh, in the base language. Uh, but but I thought that given the application that uh, Thomason wants to make, you can run similar arguments without that assumption. So so take the case where she wants to go from certain um, molecules uh, arranged table wise to uh, the existence of a table. Mm -hmm. uh, I suppose, I mean, the, the, the original, uh, suppose the original, the base theory uh, only proves that there are all these molecules. So suppose it's 20,000 molecules. Uh, so it doesn't prove that there are 20,000 in one objects in the universe. Uh, but then you, you you strengthen the theory with the application principle for tables, so you uh, so you now also get the existence of a table, and the table is going to be different from uh, any of the molecules. So now the extended theory is going to prove that there are at least uh, twenty thousand and one objects uh, in the universe, uh, whereas the and that's uh, now that that's just the existential. Uh, Existential quantification, so that's the circle is going to be already in the base language, but it's not something that was provable in the base theory. Uh, so it's, it's very similar to your argument, it just it strikes me you, you require even less assumptions about uh, what uh, vocabulary is already in the base language. Mm -hmm. I don't know. 
That's and the thing. Thanks. Um, I, I think the where it becomes difficult is if she's right about the application conditions and whatnot, then I'm not sure that the mathematics actually works out in that way. I think you would have the same number of entities in both cases, whereas one might have just different names suddenly. And I'm not sure whether they wouldn't, I mean, if metaphysically speaking, if, if that sort of thing that is the several particles arranged a certain way is a table, then the table is already there and it would be it would just tell me more or less that something went wrong in counting all the entities in in the first or in the second place do you understand what i what i'm getting at there i i'm not very familiar with thomas but i don't, I don't understand how, i mean that by assumption a theory only proves that there are twenty thousand. uh the base theory only proves that there are twenty thousand uh objects which are the molecules and so when you introduce the table i would have thought that she thinks that the table is different from any of the molecules i mean she... from the molecules yes but what is less clear to me at this point is that the assumption is already correct if the theory proves that there are twenty thousand of them and she actually thinks that a table is an object which is distinct from all of that then the first the math doesn't work out in the first theory i think for her to say, hey, okay, if the table is already there, then you just miscounted in the first place. Whatever I prove, then I would see that as a, a, well, basically showing that the theory was false in that sense. I thought the table could only come in once you use the application principle in the strength and theory. I, well, the you can derive the existence of the table but I'm not sure whether the counting still is an issue here. I mean, depends on what actually you count. If it's all the entities or all the entities which happen to be derivable in that sort of language. Okay, I see. Thank you. Thanks. Well, next question is from Brad. Brad, please. Thanks. Uh, okay, sorry if you covered this at the beginning. I missed the very beginning of the talk. But uh, I have a question that's, I think, closely related to what uh, you were just talking about. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know how to put it exactly, except um, so if you're talking about conservative extension, the, the notion that you're using is not exactly the same as the notion that, say, Hartree Field uses or Crispin Wright uses, because what he's talking about is uh, what, what they're talking about. They say, like, no new theorems about the old ontology. Right. So the, did you talk about this in, in the talk? Or, or? I, I mentioned that there is a difference, yes. Okay, all right. Um, so the, the, what, I, what I wanted to ask is just, I, I would have thought that Thomason is using that notion. Um, and then, you know, you can prove in the new theory that there exist abstract objects, but they had, that existential quantifier is different from the one in the previous language. So the, the one in the previous language is the one that's restricted to the old ontology. So it seems to me like if you if you use that notion of con conservativeness, you still get a conservative extension, unless I'm mis mistaking how everything's supposed to be working. I'm a few things. One would be what, what I gave as uh, Thomason's version. I just called it Thomason, actually. So I'm not sure even if you were, if you are right, whether that helps uh, necessary. The other thing would be if, if that brings us actually back to fields thing, when, when he starts introducing that, he realizes, hey, my theory might already kind of do too much work here. I, I need some restrictions in place. Namely, I restrict my, my base theory and it talks, so he restricts all the quantification to something like non-abstract or whatever doesn't really matter what it is and then he extends it with mathematics in a way that it just doesn't contradict the first thing and you might go around trying to do something similar here and i think what the end game then would be would that you actually do something like carry out if, if it worked you would carry out fields program on a much larger scale which seems still odd a because it doesn't really seem to work in that way and B, because it still kind of gets contra, but easy ontology 
claims to do, namely inferring abstract object. If you were able to have a conservativeness requirement of the right sort, what you would show then via Fields idea is that you don't need all these abstract objects anymore. It's just like, yeah, you have these sort of principles, but we can all do in the base theory, which is not, which only kind of talks about concrete stuff. And that strikes me as a quite implausible and be at least in spirit contra to what easy ontology attempts to do. But there is an issue there, which you're certainly right, which I bumped into in a different Q&A about this, which seems the question, why does you use this conservativeness requirement in the first place? And I think she just, so if I'm right, then she didn't realize that there is such a problem in the background here. Uh, okay, so yeah, I mean, I guess it's, it's, so it's tough because I, yeah, to talk about whether this would amount to hard tree fields program or whatever, but, but I will say that I, I believe in the, in the chapter, she mentions in a footnote that the old language doesn't quantify over the new stuff. So like, she doesn't say it very carefully in, in the quote that you gave, but I believe that she's, she's like, at least in the background aware of, of this issue anyway. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, at that point, it becomes an issue of whether her stuff still works out in any way. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't thought of, so thank you for the, if you also have suddenly the knowledge of the footnote, that would be nice. Oh, uh, yeah, suddenly, uh, two, two, page 264, footnote seven is the one I was thinking of. I just pulled it up, so. Four, footnote seven. Okay, cool. Thank you. That I checked that out. Okay, does, any, does anyone else have questions? It seems that no, so no questions. 